see how it goes. All right. So five, four, three, two, one. What is up, Shark Nation? Welcome to the Shark Pod for this week. Again, we're still in lockdown, but actually, I think Mark, <laughs> Mark's on the line there and Glenn Aguirre again. Um, I think this is actually working out well because we're, we're covering a lot of ground here with, through, the, through the Zoom links um, and we are ready to go here. We've got, uh, we've got Graeme Kenny on the line as our special guest. Uh, Graeme is a, a solicitor um, who has a really interesting story. And I was just talking to Graeme before we started today and I was thinking... Like Mark, last week we really dug into um, we really dug into a story about an entrepreneur who was who just re- uh, raised capital um, for his business, and it was very much about that kind of time in the business because it was there was lots to dig into there, right? But I think this time it's going to be a little bit better for our listeners um, to talk about um, the Graham's journey because there's a lot of people out there who. We even mentioned this before we started as well. Doing the leave, leaving cert, they might be very clever. They don't really know what to do. Um, they maybe know a couple of solicitors and they see that they, they do well, but they uh, it's not, not something that they kind of inspires them. So today, I think it'd be great if we could uh, talk about Graham's life kind of story and dig into the little bits and pieces along the way, uh, if that's okay with you, Mark. <laughs> Yeah, no, absolutely. Fascinating story. We've had a chat before off air and uh, look, very, very uh, looking forward to hearing, to hearing the full story. So, Graham, you're very welcome. Thank you. Nice to meet you both. Thanks very much. Uh, okay, so Graham, where did, so where did, the, where did the, the story start here? Um, you're from Dublin originally, right? From Dublin, grew up around Walkinstown, yeah. Around Walkinstown. So growing up in Walkinstown, um, was there people around you that were, uh, were working in, in the legal f- field? What kind of pushed you towards being a lawyer? I remember I watched uh, Liar, Liar, and I thought I wanted to be a lawyer at one stage, but couldn't get I'm glad. I'm, gl- I'm glad you could ask me that question with a straight face. No, I don't think there was. Uh, uh, there weren't many. I, I think I could be wrong now, but I think I was the first to do law in my school. Um, so I, I, I came out very young, I think it was about 16, doing the leaving certificate, which was an absolute disaster in a way, because you think that, or maybe turning, just turning 17, it was, it was good in the sense of, I'm certain for people sitting there, are not, are not sitting there leaving cert now, getting whatever grades they may get going forward. Um, I think I had the view that I, I needed to finish school, get in and out of college quickly and start what I wanted to do, what I actually wanted to do, which was quite wrong. College should be, a really great and enjoyable experience and I, I i was 19 finishing my law degree in ucd oh the, the world had passed me by like I, I just didn't get it so i came out of um i suppose one world where i was like in the evenings packing shelves in duns in crumlin shopping center um so you can you know that you can picture that for yourself and then going to the world of robo castle and ucd doing law they were diametrically opposed, kind of spe- opposite ends of the spectrum. So I've been there, super value, and then UCD as well. <laughs> yeah, so oh, wow. I, 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 I didn't get. I mean, you'll probably be aware that's where the the crumbling driven a feud erupted and, and and all the rest, and those murders were starting just as I was. Uh, um, I suppose in around that time when I just started to pack shelves and the Texas fried chicken there, and that there was a that kicked off that entire feud. So there were diametrically opposed worlds. Um, I can remember kind of coming out. I think I was put on trolleys because I was such a disaster uh, packing shelves, and I'm sitting there kind of with my law books in this little shack. Um, I was robbed twice because back in those days you had the euro coins that uh, that you had. Well, actually, the pound coins. I think they had to put in, and. Um, I think I've seen as a soft target with my little pouch reading some law book there. So people just come up to rob me. I just hand over the money. I was robbed two or three times before I was asked into Dunn's because they thought that I was part of this conspiracy of handing it away. I don't know what they thought we were wrestling under the ground or something. But I went from that world. For a few, for a few uh, pounds. <laughs> well, I, was the, I was the easiest touch in Crumlin. There you go, guys. You know, so um, I, I, from that... I came out of UCD in 1920, and then I had con- I got a, br- a brainwave then because I think I I was so kind of naive. I'd watched my idea of a lawyer was what I saw on television, so I decided I was going to be a New York attorney then. So I I got the books for it, and I studied the New York bar in my bedroom. There was a course a fella did you could do it on like 
on a screen even back in those days. Um, so we went to a class a week and watched this guy on a screen give lectures. And I studied for the New York Bar in my bedroom. So I qualified, ironically, in I passed the bar in uh, Manhattan before I qualified here. They were a different system. So you have, yeah, so you have to... Um, you have to, I suppose, over there, the, the traditional route of the kind of top lawyers would be you go to the Harvard or Yale. Um, after you've done your primary degree, you come out with your law degree then, and then you go in and you, um, you, you, you sit the New York bar and you immediately qualify as an attorney. So you go into a law firm fully qualified. Here we have a whole apprenticeship system that lasts I don't know what it is now, three, three and a half years. Uh, back then, there was really only, uh, I think UCD and Trinity were the only recognized law degrees. Now it's brilliant, it's expanded out, and anyone who wants, it was a complete cartel, to be perfectly honest. Um, they had it shut off. Now anyone who wants, you can you can do law degrees in a number of very reputable uh, colleges and go in and do, they have the what are called the FE1 exams now after that. But the whole process probably takes six or seven years. So I qualified in New York from my bedroom effectively before I qualified as a solicitor here. So I would do my apprenticeship here as a glorified photocopier um, where I could apply for jobs at like 20 for even back then um, the top law firms in, in, in uh, New York were offering like, this is 20 years ago, nearly 200 grand a year while I was on, you know, I couldn't afford my lunch photocopying and uh, doing my apprenticeship here. That's crazy. So you could have, what, what would, um, what kind of drove you then to, to take that, those exams over there? Were you thinking about that's, that's kind of where my future is going to be? Do you saw yourself as a... I, I think I probably watched too, one too many episodes of, like, what, what, what my idea, one too many episodes of the likes of LA Law or something. Um, my, the, the idea of what a lawyer was in my head, remember, like, I, I was 1920, um, and I, I don't think I'd ever even been to the four courts at that point. So my idea of how law works and how law actually works... Um, I'd seen some great films and I saw myself as this figure standing up and winning all these wonderful cases, which is, you know, the reality of it was I was standing at a photocopier and I was the, the, the ring binding king. That was essentially where all, all my skill set lay at that point. So that's where I was driven uh, uh, to. I'd also, um, I, I was going out with a girl at the time who was a dancer and she decided that she wanted to go to the, uh, it was called the Broadway Dance Centre in Manhattan. And the trip alone to New York was worth it for me. Like, I think I've been on one holiday in my life up until that. So, I, you know, I can remember going over there and I was doing an apprenticeship um, in Ireland. And one of my fellow apprentices was from Galway, who knew a chap from Galway who was living in, he, he told me rented accommodation. But when I got over there, he was actually squatting in like this port boarded up building so I arrived over with my books to do the exams and he had to like pull stuff back to let me into this yeah. what was effectively a squat in Manhattan so I'm studying at night there the, the, the days before the exams over there so it was it was kind of a, a clash of fantasy and reality of what I had this image of, of, of what law was and what I was actually going through from sitting in this place in, in, in Manhattan studying the night before to coming home and photocopying for my I was apprenticed to a, a, a lawyer at the time called Noel Smith who was Ben Dunn's solicitor and the Moriarty tribunal was going on so I, these very grandiose notions as against a fairly brutal reality of the time. And so from that squat, you pass the you pass the exams. Everything uh, is looking rosy there. You've got your yeah. yeah I was actually terrible. No one had ever shown me how to do exams, and thankfully the new and I I have to say I did well in exams, but I wasn't suited. Like I I I didn't understand. Like I was running out of stupid things like running out of time and things. I wanted to write more. The New York Bar suited me perfectly because it's like kind of a legal IQ test. You just tick the boxes. You have like four answers. You just tick them. So I flew through it. So I did really well on that exam. I was chuckling myself after that. Um, but it didn't, didn't change uh, what I was actually doing. Um, so I came back to, to Dublin, tipped away. Um, uh, very interesting time serving that apprenticeship. Actually, more so the, the, the four or five apprenticeships that, uh, four or five other apprentices are still my kind of best friends to this day. So, really? yeah, it was worth doing for that. We used to, I mean, we did very little work, I have to say. At one point, I can remember, there's one poor chap, he 
he got the, the, the envious task of, at the time of he was given a development to work on and this was seemed particularly good. I mean, to give you an idea of how hard you were working, he had to create one of these like Perspex helmets because every time you get on the phone, we thought it was hilarious to launch rubber bands at him. So that will tell you how busy we were at that time and how, you know, how high polluting we were. But those, all, all of those guys run their own practices and that now, they're all in different businesses. So there was certainly something in the room, whatever was going on. And you, you mentioned that you were uh, apprenticed to Noel Smith. The, we, we did a little bit of research there as well. It seems like this was the time, was this around Celtic Tiger time? Kind of no, it was down? before that. No, it was actually, yeah, I'm so old. It was nearly before. It, this was before the first dot-com boom. So I can remember when I was doing my apprenticeship, speaking to recruiters and that, everyone was telling me, IT is where it's at. If you're not an IT lawyer, you're nobody. And I was looking at this guy, Noel, who um, he represented Ben Dunn um, rather salaciously when he was, uh, I think he got high on coke and he was caught in Florida with a lot of prostitutes and he was going to jump off a balcony. So Noel was right, right, that's where he came to my attention. Um, there's a big, ben, for people listening, because there's people all over the world that listen to this. We've got, uh, we've got uh, 71 uh, regular listeners out there in uh, Colombia. We don't know why. but. Okay. Well, if, if, they, if they look, no disrespect to me, I don't know if they want to bang him into Google, he's an interesting oh, character. Exactly. So, no, I'm saying that the, uh, just to give some context, like Ben Dunn, big business person. The Dunns are big business people in, in Ireland. Um, and there was a, a huge case like a, in the public eye uh, in the 90s about uh, one of the, the members of the family with the, you know, with the prostitutes and the cocaine and all that type of stuff. So it's uh, just to give some context there. So this, so Noel is involved in that. He's, he's trying to get them off so the... No, Noel was representing him. He was investing in a number of shopping centres along with Ben Dunn at that time. He had um, been engaged uh, in the Moriarty Tribunal um, really uh, very uh, like very much before his time. Kind of a lawyer that... Um, uh, not the type of lawyer, actually, that's around today. He was very malleable. He got into any any number of businesses and um, he represented a lot of very high profile clients at the time including Ben who I suppose most notably came to the attention as to whether or not he gave uh, money to our then Taoiseach who's the Prime Minister at the time um, and there was a whole investigation into that so I was attracted by all of that I took up an apprenticeship there because this was one of the most high profile firms in the country at the time as I say look the landscape of laws changed very differently now and large law firms have morphed and taken that all of that kind of business there's not dissimilar to accountancy there's like five to ten big firms and then it, there's, a, there's a scaling down after that so when i left Knowles, then um i went into uh as i said i was sitting concurrently i just qualified the new york bar i qualified uh, as a solicitor here then I qualified as a solicitor in england and wales and then i went to Madison's at the time, it's good, MOPs they were called, Madison North Apprentice, which would, would, would have been one of the big five law firms. So at that stage, I bought into, um, to be the best lawyer, you have to be in the biggest firm and these paid the biggest salary and these took in, at the time, uh, what were considered the best minds in law, all of which I should say, 20 years on, there's a degree of nonsense and propaganda attached to that, which they perpetuate very well. Yeah. But if you had, if you had have asked a twenty-year-old me at that time, I thought I won the lottery, and I was, I was, you know, completely indoctrinated into that. That all evaporated pretty quickly. I went into corporate finance, and this was before the Celtic Tiger, because uh, all of the deals then would have related to uh, Los Angeles and uh, the. Silicon Valley and we were working on crazy, you know, I was working before in the morning on different time zones and that. And it struck me very quickly then, like what was, what, what, what my vision of law was and what I was doing. And I was sitting in a room going through what I call share purchase agreements, drafting warranty clauses and other nonsensical, incredibly boring matters that, that, that I thought at the time. Because obviously some people find them fantastically interesting. But for me at the time, I was like, this is nothing like what I saw on television. And the attraction that struck me was we, we closed a huge funding round for um, a very large IT company at the time that was based in um, uh, Los Angeles. And the directors had come in and there was champagne and they were all high-fiving each other. And I'd worked around the clock on this thing for weeks. Not particularly interested in it, I have to say. But when it closed, and this was my kind of eureka moment of to, you know, I don't really fit in here. When it closed... 
I was looking at those guys going, I'd much rather be them. Um, and as I returned the following day to work, and my, the partner I worked under at the time gave me another share purchase agreement. And I went back to my room to sit on my own to read another warranty clause as I was thinking of all those guys high-fiving each other. Of course, it was a completely romanticized view and everything at the time, but I went, this is not what I want to do. And I bought into, and again, everyone's very different, but you have to identify what your type of personality type is. And when you're that young, I mean, I, I'm, I'm struggling now to identify what type of personality type I have. When I was that young, I didn't have a clue, but I innately knew this is, I cannot spend the rest 20 years of my life drafting warranty clauses in a room on my own. Um, and this was not what I, this was not what I signed up for. So it was a very difficult moment in the sense of, I was incredibly lucky to be in the position that I was in. I was in the job at the time that was envious of most other solicitors in my class and all the rest, I would have been paid the most, uh, which was all that mattered to me at the time, was I on the top range of pay for X number of years post-qualification. But I was dying. I mean, there was, there was no emotional maturity there. And I was thinking to myself, this is a disaster, I need out. So I left and I was seen at the time as, you know, I, I can remember the partner who's all very helpful people having a discussion with me saying, you know, Graeme, if, if you keep going like the way you're going in X years, you could be sitting where I'm sitting. And in my head, I'm thinking, that is the last. I'm gone. That's like, that, I, 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 all being that he was, said. <laughs> like, all being he was saying it in an encouraging manner, I was going, oh, Lord, this is the last thing I want, my friend. But um, just different personality types. There's nothing wrong with the job. Very intelligent people doing, you know, and, and in fairness, doing, a, you know, wonderful work. They're like, they, they are the best at what they do. I just, didn't realize what they did until I was there. And um, I left then and then I tried, I, I met a, a great guy um, and we set up a, a business a law firm together. And from there on in, I worked for myself. Amazing. So I love hearing about that. I think me and Mark talked about this before with the different people on the podcast, the, the kind of turning points in people's lives that when the kind of the realization parts, um, like I, I remember when I, when I left college, everybody wanted to work for, you know, going to finance after uh, UCD. So I worked for uh, Davy Stockbrokers um, and it wasn't for me, but it's for a lot of people and they've stayed there and done well. But I remember at one stage we were, we were doing something and I turned to somebody and I'd only been there about two months. Um, and I turned to somebody and I said, is this our job? I thought we might just be chipping in yeah. something. And, and then they're, they're, it didn't endear me to my, uh, to my yeah, I don't know. I, I don't have a similar just, experience. I can't believe this is what we're doing. Like, you know, so. And what's, what's hard in those large organizations is you literally, you become brainwashed and it, I, I don't think it's consciously done or otherwise, but you know, I can remember back then the Celtic Tiger was starting to take off the dot com boom um, or the dot com slump was just about happening in 2001. And it was all about billable hours and you had these ridiculous scenarios. It's very interesting to see the psychology of people in those large organizations leaving jackets on the back of their chairs to give that ambiguity. Has he gone home or is he just in the toilet and he's still working away? God, that, you know, and it was all about, it was, you know, the, there was a coffee machine that was put in, in the middle of the, so you had all these offices and there was a coffee machine put in like the, 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 the middle of the, the ground between the offices. And the, the thinking behind it was, if you go for your coffee, there's no hanging around. Because you're standing there, you get your coffee. If you're seeing twiddling your thumbs or looking around, it's like, is he not busy? And that translated in some way to, he's not the best because the best has the most billable hours. So you scurry back into your room to get back on to whatever you were doing and bill more green time that went out. So you were like indoctrinated, which is, fantastic system if you're at the top of it and you're an equity partner but when you're scuttling back to your room to get a coffee you know it, and, it, it, it didn't strike me as what i wanted to do and and graham is that is that the is that the deal you put in 20 years and then you may be an equity partner is that what people is, sometimes when you look at those organizations like what is everyone trying to do here are they trying to but, well there's a degree there's a degree of a fallacy even within that that's what's sold if you put in the hours um, you know, you'll work your way up the ranks. The reality is, like any other business, it comes down to by the time you reach equity partnership, and this, this is for every law firm across the country. It doesn't matter how many hours you do; it's how much money are you bringing in. But you're, that that's not told to you at the time. So there's a whole salary partner kind of indoctrination process that's brought up, 
and generally it works very well for most people and if you want to you know if, if you you'll be very well paid you'll give up a lot of hours of your life and if you enjoy that work it's fantastic if you don't um, it's somewhat of a mythical existence because you'll you'll be brought through that, that ranking system only to find after giving up say 15 years of your life or otherwise if you don't make equity um, there's a difficulty you're you're a salary partner albeit a handsome salary relative to you know the, the the general working wage and i'm not ignorant of that but it's only why i suppose when you get to the upper echelons you realize like this just simply comes down to what what's my client base how much money i can bring in so if you're aligned to a large developer you're going to get a lot of equity points not because you're a great lawyer not because uh you 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 have the best insider or, or otherwise into that particular legal sphere but because maybe you play tennis with him once a week and he just wants to run his business uh through yours but when you're sitting there at 20 drafting these warranty clauses that doesn't occur to you at the time it's just if i've won this path for 10 years and i sell my life and i do all these hours one day i'm going to be that guy in that office and I don't, i'm not sure why i want to be that guy in that office but everyone else here does so i, I think that's what i want to be as well this is Matt, this is exactly how it was when I was working with Davey as well. Everyone had this this division of but like the, the whole thing is as well with Davey or any other company like that, it is how much money that you can bring in at the top. Of course. Anyway, of course. It's not a big it's not a big, uh, it's not a big difference there. But like the so what happens then? So I know America has some questions as well, so I'm, I'm excited to get into the uh, the story here. No, I I'm seeing a lot of parallels with with the big four accountancy firms as well. It's very, very similar, Graham, as you know yourself. Yeah. Hmm. But yeah. I, I'm interested in, like, a lot of people have who who's, say they're in their 30s or 40s now, their decision in their which career they would choose or which path they would choose was probably taken at age six, age 17, whatever you have to be Absolutely. to do to leave and start. Yeah. You're yeah. looking at a list of professions, usually. It's usually professions. Like I said, I flipped the coin between accountancy and, and, and uh, a solicitor. And but it never takes into consideration your personality. And I and often it actually takes about five years to figure out that it's not for you, it's, which is a pity because I took, took did three years as an accountant to realize that I didn't want to do it. And then I was one. And then it's how do you pivot from there? And similar to yourself, then I, I knew I wanted to, to do my own thing and have my own business. And that's what I did. And maybe the journey is all part of it, but it's it's kind of a pity that, People can't figure that out for themselves or with a bit of help from a guidance counselor, which always comes up, which I don't know. Did you have any, any mentors or a guidance counselor? No, absolutely not. I look at all these like YouTube videos and all mentors and things. No, I I mean, my guidance counselor, I don't know what the hell I can remember in my school. Like I said, I don't think anyone did law until I went. So my guidance counselor certainly didn't, you know, say this is where you're going. I was probably told to be a mechanic or something. I can't remember back, but I wouldn't have, no no disrespect to mechanics, let's just say, but it was that, that was just, more more of an obvious selection um at that time so we would have been you know given different advice it wasn't this is how you're you know this is how you're going to end up running a law firm there was no one had done it so th- th- that just wasn't on our radar i think as well people kind of get into um you get into debt um and that fixes you in your position so you've a twofold process one you don't want to look back and believe that you've just wasted a decade of your life. So your brain keeps telling you, you're in this cocooned environment where everybody else is doing it and you're all in this race together and you're spending so many hours in these offices that you're, you're, you're buying into, no, 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 I'm right, I'm definitely right because everyone else, there's a, even if there's a voice in your head going, this is not really for me, what does that mean? You're gonna, you're gonna do something else after 10, 15 years. And what, what was, you know, what was like the partner talking to me, even if and we were very different personalities, but even if he was to look back and go, you know, I, what you're saying makes a lot of sense to me. He's not going to look in the mirror after 20 years and go, what a wasted journey that was. He has to have justification in his head. So 100%. you're talking, you're talking to the wrong people to begin with. Um, you're, you know, you're, you're, you don't hear other voices coupled with, what society deems as success is you have a nice car you have a nice house what's that really translate to it translates to debt people taking a mortgage so you get a mortgage to maintain a particular house or otherwise if you're lucky nowadays and then you're trapped debt is like this trap and there's no getting off that carousel and no one tells you that either you go through the entirety of school and no one ever tells you this is how you make a loan application this is how insurance this is how interest rates work like you know with no disrespect to other subjects 
it would be far more like everybody's going to end up going to the supermarket. Everybody's going to end up going to the bank. You don't really learn those particular skills. And I don't mean in a simplistic manner. Like most people, if they're lucky in life, will fill in a mortgage form and go, to, wh why not learn that in school? So you come out and you're put into these debt instruments that effectively trap you. And believe me, I should know about being trapped by debt. I go into tens of millions of it. But even like if, if it's a 10 grand overdraft and you don't have 100 euros, 10 grand may as well be 100 million. If you have a mortgage and you have a property, your mind doesn't want to admit that it's wasted time. Everybody is subject to that keeping up with the Joneses. You don't want to give up the house because you've ranked yourself in society somewhere and to turn around and say, actually, I lost the house. Oh God, I think it's going badly for you. Like, you don't want to uh, admit that to yourself. So you're caught between the people around you, this superficial interaction you have with people that you think are running the same race as you. And then that once, once your salary goes up, that introduces debt and debt will anchor you in life so that you can't get off the carousel. It's such an interesting way of putting it as well, because I mean, you know, Mark has uh, two kids as well. Um, and you would worry about that type of thing where they, they're not being exposed to those ideas. So like you said, like I went to like another friend of the podcast, uh, Alex, he's our, uh, my Ironman coach. Uh, but friend as well who lives in Bray. But when he went to buy an apartment there, I couldn't believe how he was buying his property versus how I was buying my property. When we went in, I brought my wife in. She loved this. She's going to put this over here. You know, the price that we, we were like negotiation was minimal in front of the salesperson. We're, we're loving it. We're looking at the view, all that type of stuff. Uh, when I went with uh, Alex, he's like, you know, he's from Serbia. So he's like an outsider you know, in the property system already and um, but he went and he's got this beautiful beautiful apartment in bray but he went in and they were asking x amount and he got it for some he got a great deal right and he 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 was basing all of his decisions on per like the the price per square meter um how close it is to schools like uh, how much he can rent it out uh, a multiple of that and i'm like irish people don't really <laughs> we, we buy with uh with a, an emotional um Oh, oh, definitely, definitely. And people don't understand. Like I said, the first set of things you buy, the first thing I bought was a car. It was this flashy BMW, you know. First first thing I bought, I don't know what it was worth at the time, but it was what a disastrous choice that was, like a depreciating asset, you know, like from, from day one. But all, all that mattered to me at the time was, and I, I, I wasn't that wrong, I, I, I needed something to show for all these hours I was putting in. I didn't have the money to buy a house, so I'm going to buy this stupid car and everyone's going to think I'm a great success. I'm going to drive around because my friends don't have this car, so I must be doing great. So you're buying into this whole system that's going to nail you to the floor before you even start. The unfortunate point about it is you have to go, <clears throat> for most people, you, you know, you, you have to be 15, 20 years in of paying down these loans before you realize this. I, I'm trapped. The, the the big car thing is interesting because it's it's tempted me a few times um, when I done well with something or got some sort of bonus or big commission thing. I'm like, you know, we, I deserve a good car now. Do you know what I mean? Uh, yeah. I love a decent car, but you know, uh, the Mercedes Benz, the BMWs, whatever. I tried to avoid that if I could, but I can understand when you leave your. I wonder if you when you left your the the math and Matheson and you started your own. Uh, business where you a little bit you wanted to show how good you were doing to those guys as well because what was the feeling I, I mean this all, obviously like you're, like everybody any businessman that has done well behind it all is a complete ball of insecurity because what and this is kind of something society entirely misses in all of these nonsensical uh entrepreneurial uh videos on youtube and that that are all pumped up americans or whatever shouting at the screen about 10xing something like what what you have to you have to kind of behind it all everyone is largely the same and anyone you have to question if somebody is if somebody is that driven to do that incredibly well what we determine success why are they doing that why was enough not enough what made them keep going and that applies in everything and generally behind it all is a woeful insecurity and that was certainly behind me and it takes a lot to kind of you don't you don't kind of reach where your kind of inner zen moment without going that i was an incredibly insecure person and that's why i was doing it instead you see now youtube videos of people high-fiving and they're getting all these things of course all those things are wonderful but what they're not selling is just 
like how happy is that making you and that sounds a real cliche though money doesn't bring you happiness it doesn't and uh, believe me i should know it um because i got all of the trinkets that anybody could possibly get and when i analyze now what made me so driven it's because exactly as, as you said i needed to show something i needed to show something what i felt other people the reality was i needed to show it to myself because somewhere inside when i put my head on the pillow at night i probably at some level thought you know that, that i wasn't good enough and that that doesn't apply just to me that applies to i categorically assure you because i've had practically well not i've had countless extremely well-known businessmen through my doors all of the the kind of titans of commerce from uh, people you know from the people who the, the heads of banks down to the best known entrepreneurs in this business are sat in boardrooms with and most of them and not all of them some are very well-reasoned people but most incredibly well-driven people are quite dysfunctional and that's not spoken about on your YouTube video as you're punching the air and screaming out to them. They're quite dysfunctional and they, you know, everything generally relates back to your childhood and all of the, 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 the kind of component parts of your psychology that are, that you are put together before you're probably 15 years of age and what builds it up. And you surround yourself with what is seen as success to mask both to the world and yourself that things probably aren't completely right you're probably not you know entirely balanced and i know certainly that applied to me and that applied I, like i said i've encountered at this stage i've acted for uh, you know all of the people who would appear in your sunday newspapers and it's it's a fairly common tra trait if you're the best 100 meter sprinter of course there's a, a genetic aspect uh, to it and you probably have you know a, an innate ability that, that goes for business as well. But outside of that, why is that guy getting up at five in the morning when everyone else is? Why is that guy putting in extra training sessions? Of course, you can say he's particularly driven and he's competitive and all the rest. No one ever pauses to think, is it because he's unhappy? Is it because he's trying to prove something? Is it because he's, he, he has to go that little bit further than everybody else to distinguish himself because he feels he has to be distinguished? No one asks the question, why does that guy have to be distinguished? Why can he not just sit, in a, sit at home and read a book and be happy? And that's the that's Great the bit that's the bit of success that nobody tells you. And I didn't realize all of that. And you don't have those kind of soul searching moments until I would have got into eight figure tens of millions of debt. Um, I would have had all of the, the the trinkets that you could possibly imagine: the lovely house, the convertible cars, the holidays. You name it. You name it. I I I, I you know I, I, it was a period of my life where I thought I lived in the Rolling Stones. When all that was taken away and I crashed and the 2007 crash came there's a lot of introspection and you take up things that can't be taken away from you like I started to play the piano at that age I did all of the grades all with you know up to grade eight in classical piano I think subconsciously because those things can't be taken away and those things add intrinsically something to you that the car doesn't so there's there's something creative or there's something in and of yourself that you can put into those things that's sitting in your car and driving around hoping somebody sees you can't get you. That's incredibly yeah. insightful. I feel like no one's asking <laughs> at all. Like even like the, you know, you said about there, there's a genetic component of those, those people as well, but even uh, I know Mark has done a, a painting recently of Michael Jordan uh, and that documentary that's popular right now on Netflix. Like a lot of people are saying that, uh, wow, I didn't know Michael was, was such an asshole. I'm like, I think you probably should have uh, imagined that he's trying. What, what else could he be at, at, <laughs> if he's that driven? He doesn't care about anything else. He doesn't care about other humans, you know? So, a, 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 raging, a raging narcissist. I mean, I saw that program. I, I should say, Mark, that that was one of the things that uh, I noticed. What an incredible uh, portrait. Fantastic. I was one of the things that kind of drew you to my attention. I thought, quite apart from even meeting you, I saw the painting that you did. I was like, my God, that, that, there's something of substance now. There's something that's fairly incredible. That, uh, Thanks you know, very much. That, yeah, really, really brilliant. But I watched that documentary. And having lived the life I've lived, everybody, if you say to somebody in school now, would you like to be Michael Jordan? I'd love to be Michael Jordan. What does that actually mean? You'd like all those trinkets. Of course, we all love those trinkets. We all want that kind of... Uh, to be noticed or otherwise but when you dig into that what does that actually mean why did michael jordan actually need that when you watch that documentary it's not a guy if you, if you look at his emotional maturity it's not a guy i'd want to be like if somebody said to me is he talented my god like there's a talent there that's unquantifiable it's just you know it's unique amongst humankind 
would you want to be him? I'm not so sure I'd want to be him. If you see, you see him sitting there, all of the towels, he's a drink sitting beside. Not that that means anything in particular, but it's an unusual thing to have in this day and age when you're being interviewed. The gambling um, that is constantly referred to throughout. And even if he didn't have an issue with otherwise gambling, it's this constant affirmation that he required. Like the only brief tell in all of that documentary was where it was referred to his relationship with his father. And he was told to go back into the house. He wasn't good enough and all the, uh, and all the rest. Those incidents are what created Michael Jordan. So this, you know, magnificent talent that, was cre that, that is on display is largely born from insecurity and unhappiness. And that's the bit that people don't get. And that applies to business as well. You look at great businessmen and how driven they are. And I need to open more outlets. I need more properties. I need whatever. Nobody pauses for a moment. That incident where his father told him to go back into the house because he wasn't good enough probably changed his life. So interesting. In your experience with some of the, like I said, the, the people in the Sunday papers, is there any, is there, like without naming names, have you ever met any of those, those kind of business people that are the big names in, in Irish uh, society. And you said this guy has it all together. Like this guy is, you know, uh, balanced. Right. Balance is, is what I mean, yeah. Um, very rarely. I mean, I've acted for kind of most big Irish developers and, you know, I've acted for people who, you know, a quick Google search to show you I, some, some of the people I've acted for have been involved in the Anglo trial, which was the, the largest, the three billion, the largest trial ever to come before the High Court. Um, all, even, even the individuals I acted for, the, the guys you may have seen on the news who their life is under threat now, um, m most unfortunately. Um, so all of those things that have kind of defined Irish culture, like the collapse of Anglo Bank and all, all of the people, I'm not saying those specific uh, individuals, but all of, all of those people surrounding that and all of the people that emerged from the Celtic Tiger. If you look at most of the developers who did particularly well, highly dysfunctional people. And anyone who's in, you know, in or around them, like they're seen as personalities and they're the, the quirky traits. And your man, a great drinker, and Jay's going to go out and do this. I look at that fella, he's up. Most of them are highly dysfunctional and no one ever no one ever kind of averse to that or looks into that or what what is that incredible that's not to say you can't be incredibly successful and very well balanced it's just if i was if i was to go back to my 20 year old self i'd tell i'd have a far different narrative than what i see on youtube of people you know these david goggins type characters screaming at themselves out running what are you doing what are you doing? What, what what people look at for inspiration or otherwise I mean, without kind of becoming a Zen Buddhist about it, it is just about happiness and, and what you're doing and contentment. If you're, if you're doing that at a monstrous level in hundreds of millions, fantastic. But if you're chasing that for that Zen piece, it ain't coming. And when you're 20, you certainly don't realize that. Do you know what? It, uh, my, uh, my friend, the, the Serbian guy actually sent me a book as a gift, an audio book, the David Goggins one. And at one stage, he's uh, to prove something. I'm not sure what he's trying to prove, but he ran. Uh, he ran so far that his uh, his feet were broken. <laughs> I was just like, I don't know who's. I, I'm, I'm who's got right. anywhere. I, I I train practically every day. I'm in SBG. You know, I I I, I on the mats with guys strangling, trying to break their arms every night. Well, I'm not at the moment because of the pandemic. Uh, but. I'm the guy who has to be told to stop. I don't need motivation. And anyone who knows me knows that. I'm the guy who has to be told enough is enough. That's, that's fine. You don't need to do another round, Graham. Get off the mat, come out of the cage. But you go home, have a share. I'm that guy who needs to be told to stop. So David Goggins has nothing for me in running along and screaming at himself to go uh, further away. The guy who has something for me is the guy who could tell me why I'm the guy who has to stay on the mat uh, uh, and can't come off. What's compelling you? What, what is, is that drive born from absolute happiness? I'm not saying it is or it isn't, but to investigate that, that's the guy I want to see on YouTube. He's not out running with his top off screaming at himself. I don't need to hear from that guy. <laughs> Likewise, I don't need to hear from anyone these kind of successful, what are deemed incredibly successful business people. If someone was to say to me, what was the best kind of business uh, uh, event of my life? It was sitting on my couch. I, I, I had everything. Um, the crash came in 2007. I should actually probably tell you how, how I got to that. We, we, myself and my business partner identified Ireland have a very unusual uh, set of legal uh, laws around um, 
the purchase of property. And in particular, we're a throwback to the British system of, of feudal landlords. So we had identified that um, if you look, if you look the, 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 the way estates were built in the 1940s and 1950s, um, they, there was an awful lot of more green area than there was now. So to put a very long, boring story short, it's not, it's not as sexy as some IT uh, uh, kind of app that somebody built. My kind of rise in that regard is, is far duller. But essentially what it was, was identifying that these green areas um, could be built on now. And we valued the purchase of those portfolios on what we call the collection of ground rents, which is the lowest form of estate you can have. So people bought their property, but they still owe what was known as a peppercorn or small rent to these landlords. We bought those portfolios based on the value of those reoccurring rents every year. But the intrinsic value were these green areas that we'd identified that you could rezone, build on. So within a short period of time of that, we've leveraged up to obscene amounts of money. Uh, from a relatively low cost base because of the way we valued and done the deal to the way that we could leverage. We leveraged that money up and invested it in every, like Asian property funds. At one stage, I was involved in funding um, shopping centers on Wilshire Boulevard. I, I went to Los Angeles, you know, it was, it was the second time I, I'd ever seen LA. Um, actually, interestingly, relating back to my um, years uh, uh, to show how, how I suppose disgruntled and driven I was when I was 20. Um, I'd applied for a job in Manhattan uh, to a law firm. I won't say their name. One of the large law firms in, uh, in, in Manhattan. Actually, I will. Uh, Coven and Burlings. So it doesn't make it. Uh, don't, it consume me after. Um, and they sent me a rejection letter. Fast forward, I'd say, 10 years. They essentially said, because I didn't go to Harvard or Yale, I, uh, you know, I, they, wouldn't, they wouldn't look at me. And of course, I thought, having gone to UCD and got a law degree, I was king of the world in Ireland. But they you were completely dismissive of me. I heard then we were able to leverage these sites um, and we got into every bank at the, uh, by securitizing these sites and, and creating loans out of them and flipping money into other things. Um, one of the directors in Lisney's at the time had said to me, I don't know whether you're interested, but we have this building out in Washington. I don't know whether you heard of this law firm, but they're starting out there. I was like, I'm in. So myself and I think eight other people, we bought this kind of small skyscraper. And I remember ringing the part purely purely down so I could go, I could send him my rejection letter uh, oh. for like 10 years previously. I remember like saying to him, I really hope your lift breaks one day. And you know, yeah. you're gonna, obviously, <laughs> yes. But we were motivated to, you know, you name it, we invested in it. Um, in London, we bought the Department of Environment in Belfast. Like we were flying at that time. When, when the world turned, and I could go through all of that, you know, if I was sitting in a pub regaling people of, of, of all of the, the great business deals, you would think it would be one of those things that I would recount. And the reason I'm kind of flipping over them is because there are largely irrelevances in, in, to me, I suppose, in, in the long run. The biggest kind of lesson or otherwise I learned was when the, the, uh, the economy turned and I found myself in gross negative equity. I had five major banks. I'd have to take my shoes and socks off to figure out uh, how much money I owed them at the time. Uh, the world changed. I can remember kind of walking into Bank of Ireland on Baggett Street and it went from being brought into the back room to the, the, one of the managers uh, saw me and kind of scuttled into the, into the back. So I had to queue up and I kind of realized, oh, I'm the, I'm the great, amongst the great unwashed now. You know, like I, I, the, the world has suddenly changed down to uh, ultimately having to sell, sell my home. So I went from having more money than I could possibly spend or more money than my family could like generationally could possibly spend in a lifetime to, I'm not so sure I can buy food this week. I had this incredibly fancy car and I was going, I, I wonder, this, this, this damn thing is sucking diesel up here. You know what I, what I, like all of a sudden I became uh, a green warrior, on my, you know, because I, I think this. so from, from expenditures on things like where I, I, you know, I could throw money into something as a laugh almost to try and buy a building in Washington to piss some partner off that may or may not have remembered me from 10 years previously to, <laughs> I'm, not so, send the letter. <laughs> I, I, I'm not so sure uh, I need this car anymore. It's kind yeah. of sitting in the driveway laughing at me uh, now, you know, and if someone was to say to me, what was, you know, the biggest business event or otherwise, well, any of those silly things, I was sitting on my couch, probably crying, thinking my world was over and coming back from that 
And that's the guy I want to hear from on YouTube. And that's not the guy that's giving the business lectures. Instead, you want to see a guy in Vegas punch the air telling you he's going to 10x everything. I don't want to hear from him. He's nothing for me. I want to hear the guy who, who, who is sitting there saying, I was that guy sitting on my couch crying into my hands. Because that's the only lesson. All of the, it's, it's easy to be punching the air on a Vegas sky when you have loads of money and you know, you're know you businessman of the year. That's easy. And, you're, and banks are drawn to you and there's a smell of success from you. Everybody wants to lend. I can remember sitting, I bought uh, a property on Fitzwilliam Square where we housed our premises. This magnificent office sitting there, king of the world and Bank of Scotland were on to me um, and they, they, they rang me over, you know, we think you should invest in this property, uh, Asian property fund. There was a, 700 grand. They're, so they're calling you with opportunities at this stage. They're they're call, no, no, this, this is my point. This is my story about how, when you're on top, how easy it is. They were calling me. I said, oh, you know, I'm not so sure about that. I, I'd still have, ultimately, after three or four calls, they'd given me the amount to invest. They'd given me the repayments for a period of three years and a separate loan. And then they'd give me a third loan to finance the interest on all of that. They send around a draft. This is all like two days. They send around a draft for like, I think it's a million euros that we were to invest in this property fund. What did I have to do? The extent, the extent of my involvement in that deal was my signature. The bank put that together. So when you're rolling and when you're, you know, looked at like the, Things will find you, like great deals will find you. Money will open doors for you. I don't want to hear from that guy. I want to hear from the guy who's fallen on his arse where, you know, the bank aren't calling him. The woman is scuttling back in. The manager is scuttling back in behind the counter in case you make eye contact with her because she's going to, you know, there's going to be an incredibly awkward, you know, all of a sudden you're not invited to the summer barbecue for the, in the private client group. Like, that's the guy. That's the only guy I want to hear from because that's the only person who's had to sit down and reevaluate things. And Graeme, was there any way to get through that? Or So, do you know, the, uh, like when I hear stories about the, the, the Celtic Tiger um, and people, those types of deals, because that's not the first time I've heard of that type of thing where it's very much, <laughs> like, like I said, the ball's rolling and you're just kind of going along with it. Is there, was there any way that if you were to do things differently, could you avoid the, if you're invo- involved with property, if you're involved with investing, is there any way to avoid the, the crash or was that inevitable anyway? So, No, you can't, you can't avoid the crash as such because that's, that's um, an extrinsic feature. But to use kind of those cliches of you can only control what's, in you, what's under your control essentially. Yeah. And the two things I say to anybody is the most basic requirements, food and shelter have a place where you can live so that when you come back, you know, you can be gambling millions, but when you come back, you have a roof over your head because when you come in, you pull up the doobie, you know, it's all going wrong, but I'm going to watch the television in bed now and and you have that headspace and you have enough money to feed yourself. Outside of that, everything's a game. Outside of that, everything's a gamble. Once you throw, and unfortunately the way Irish banks have things, and we're, we're unique to this, like this isn't the way world banking happens. I think it was Anglo actually introduced the personal guarantee which is like sitting down at a poker table and you're going all in on every deal. And once you default, people don't get it at the start. Once you default on any business deal, that personal guarantee means everything can go. So it's like sitting down in Vegas going, I think this is a good hand and I'm going all in on every hand. So if I was to do it again, yeah, gamble away. Make, you know, and gamble's a bad word, but I mean, that's essentially what you're doing. No one has a crystal ball. Make whatever investments you want, but ring fence, somewhere to live and enough money to feed yourself so that if everything crashes, you can, you can, you know, even, and it doesn't have to be a particularly salubrious place. I just mean, I've, I've gone through the experience of, you know, one of the things that the, I had a beautiful three-story home. I, I um, at the time when things were going wrong, um, and one of the things the banks were insistent on was that you get out of that what they considered a trophy home. There was a degree of you have to be seen to pay for your for your wrongs, despite the fact the guys were holding that as a like. So yeah. they say you can have a home, but that one's too fancy. They get to have a, a say in that. Place. Yeah, you're you're not driving around in those cars. You're not living in that house. You owe us this money, and of course you're sitting across again. No disrespect, you're sitting across from people who may, not, may or may not have a mortgage, but all of a sudden they became incredibly empowered and 
they're looking at you going, look at Mr. Fancy Pants, I'm, I'm going to show him. And it goes back to faceless credit committees. That's the way the, 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 the banks have things structured. You never, so you have a relationship manager, you never get to the credit committee. You do when you get borrowings big enough because all of a sudden one of those guys is going to be beating you because it's that kind of old adage of when you owe enough money, it's the bank's problem. I can remember actually sitting out in AIB and meeting a guy from the credit committee. And it was the first guy that the bullshit ended. He was the first guy to say, at some point in the future, Graham, this is probably like 2012, and get right off. Debt write off wasn't in the, the banking lexicon. Like no no one had heard the word debt write off or haircuts or otherwise. It was roll ups, interest only. We're gonna do a, somehow somehow the crash is going to just solve itself and all these things are going to come back. And he was the first person to say to me, very casually, because he was a kind of a shot caller for want of a better description, at some point in the future, you're going to uh, experience a degree of pain and we're going to have to share that with you and how right he was. And one of the things I would say to anyone when things fall apart, and this is probably the most valuable lesson I've ever learned in terms of crisis. When I, like I said, I'm quite an obsessive person. I'm the guy in the gym who has to be told to leave. And if I'm presented with a problem, I have that washing machine brain of rumination. I'll just keep going over and over and over. And I can't leave it, especially if there's no solution. And certainly, I found, my I found my position where I was in such gross negative equity, unless I won the Euro millions, not the lottery, the lottery wouldn't have paid off my house. Unless I won the Euro millions, I wasn't coming out of it. And that Did, was you, play? Start... Did you play? Did you play the, Did you play no, the Euro millions? <laughs> no, my father does, I was hoping he would. Uh, <laughs> uh, unless that was to happen, quite literally, unless I won the Euro millions, there was no way out. And the one thing that I would say to myself if I was to go back over and trying to fix a problem that is unfixable, because it was unfixable at that time, the rules change. And it's kind of that old adage of how do you eat an elephant, piece by piece. If you can't solve the problem now, it's probably because you're missing a piece of the jigsaw. And in my case, the laws changed. The policy surrounding debt write-off changed. Banks, uh, banks went under. Bank of Scotland, Bank of Scotland left and did deal. Ultimately, my loans were referred to Lloyd's and did deals with me. You know, give us whatever you have and just good luck to you because we're going under ourselves. <clears throat> Those policies weren't carried over immediately to Bank of Ireland and AIB. Legislation was introduced to deal with that. You could fight them back in courts to say that the debts could be written down to market value and all the rest. And without boring your listeners about that, was the, the point I'm trying to make is, with the elapse of time, the rules change. So if the problem cannot be fixed, and it, mine, mine couldn't be fixed, and I went through every possible solution in my head at the time, the rules change and circumstance change. And I sit here today, I literally don't owe a euro to any bank of an equity and everyone like that. My position has entirely reversed. And I would, I would have considered that quite an, an unbelievable and untenable position, say in 2012. And the reason for that was I wasn't wrong, but with the elapse of time, you get additional jigsaw pieces. So you're trying to look at a picture and you're going, I just, I can't work this out. But as every month passes, you're handling another jigsaw piece. And what I would say to anybody kind of in that ruminating washing machine mindset is the rules change in everything. In every business problem, the rules change over time. Things that can't be fixed, there's nothing unfixable. And that the elapse of time gives you new weapons to kind of attack the problem. It's interesting. And some of the lessons I guess you learned from that, would you be trying to talk to your clients about that if they're getting crazy, if they're if these, these offers are coming over the phone? To, the, to those guys that are in that kind of role? Are you kind of trying to tell no, them? No, no, gener generally not. I mean, we, I'm doing an awful lot of insolvency, obviously, in these times. I'm hoping next week to complete the first high court examinership, which is a, a, an insolvency restructuring process. So certainly through my own experiences, um, I've, I've, I suppose, learned how to deal in crises. And I've seen extraordinary crises. And I've had... Um, quite unbelievable interactions with people. I mean, there was, there was one guy, <clears throat> they will make a film about this guy one day. Uh, I've never actually been able to talk about him before, but I befriended this guy who would have said he was a billionaire at the time, which I seriously doubt, but certainly he was worth three or 400 million. And I was flying over to London to meet him. He was originally Irish born. I was flying over to London to meet him every week. He had an investment vehicle called Arcadia, which is very important 
Um, and the spelling of that is A-O-K-A-G-A, -A -A, and I was his lawyer at the time. Um, and I'll explain the significance of that wording uh, in a moment. I would have gone over to him. I would have invested heavily with him at the time. Um, he essentially uh, was a fraudster. I didn't, I didn't appreciate this at the time, but he, he was quite genuinely worth this at least three or 400 million to the point where George Mitchell, who I think was the, I think was the, the, the head, of, I think it was Royal Bank of Scotland at the time, left that position to, to become CEO of this gentleman's fund. Um, I flew over, I met him uh, in this house that was like a, a castle, effectively. And we, I'd go over most weekends. Uh, he, he was incredibly uh, good, a confident strictster to the extent that he knew, for example, the first house that I, was, that I, I revert to that, 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 that I bought was on Bloomfield Avenue. The reason I bought that house in my 20s was simply because I, I quite love for James Joyce and the main character was named after the house Mr. Bloom so I went down that's how I got into it I said I have to buy this house I went over to this guy he presented me with an original Ulysses which cost a fortune and I was like he's sitting in his in his library I was like this is just incredible and um, all the while little did I know that I'm being sucked in to make investments uh, uh, with him he then came up he then uh, brought me to invite me to dinner um, at one of the dinners was um, a former, I won't say it now, former Ireland football Ireland manager, and he said this. The, the 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 gentleman I was visiting was originally from Cork. We got discussing football. I was never particularly good at football, but my father loved it. He got a great idea then that we buy Cork City Football Club, which he did. You can Google this and say Arcadia bought it, and there's a reason I'll tell you the name. The idea was that this Ireland manager would help in getting players or something of that nature in. Um, Peripheral involvement, but nonetheless very interesting. I put the, the company through examinership. We bought it because my father liked soccer. I made my father the CEO of Cork City Football Club. So we had this football team all the time. To put a very long story short, all of that ultimately collapsed through, it, like I say, it was a confidence trick, trickster. Um, I subsequently found out then that this man had escaped from the Maze Lankesh as an IRA prisoner in like 1971, 1972. Um, the gentleman running, escaping with him was shot in the back of the head. Um, he, uh, that same individual, and the reason I say Arkadja, he told me afterwards was kind of a tongue-in-cheek joke of, um, it was Arkadja, which is the Irish, the English spelling of the Irish Arkadja, which meant our friends. Yeah. He then turned out to have a, a fraud conviction in 1996 for selling Lamborghini cars in Ireland, which he claimed he was doing on behalf of the IRA. The story just got more bizarre yeah. as it went on. I, I attended this man's, um, he flew me in to Cardiff University because they were naming a wing after him. Um, because he, he donated money for their cancer research, which I was, and this was, this was where I was being drawn in to invest quite a lot of money, which was effectively a con. But to show the level of the con or the craziness of those times, I flew into Cardiff University and little, I, I, uh, Big McFarlane, who was a hunger striker, uh, was playing the fiddle or something for him uh, uh, at, at this party. Cardiff University, and you can Google this afterwards because it sounds like a made up story, subsequently changed the name back of the wing they named after him because they found out he was a faucet. They got no money. This guy took my money. Ultimately, he lost his house. Uh, George Mitchell left Arcadia, presumably after finding out what the whole thing was about and the, and the, the environments, the IRA and all the rest. But the one, the one thing I learned from that guy was if you, you become what you say you are. So if and we were talking about kind of briefly before we came on at the start in terms of sales and where to position yourself. You become what, what, you, what you are. And this guy was the pinnacle I saw. Like he genuinely was worth probably 400 million. He'd tell you he was a billionaire, but he was genuinely worth about 400 million. All of that money was made on these statements of, of, what, uh, of what he said he was and people just buy into that in anything so in any business in mind if you come out they obviously have to have a degree of substance if you claim to be the best at what you are and uh, look, uh, you're probably aware there's a client of mine conor mcgregor if you come out you say you, 
you are that thing. You become that thing in people's minds. You are the best. You become that thing. And this guy, unfortunately for me, because I ended up suing him in Jersey over a long period of time, not getting a, where we scuttled off money, not getting a euro. If you come out and you say, this is what you are, and you, and you say you can eyeball people, and this guy could probably do it so well because he had some kind of psychiatric condition that he believed, like any good lie has such a grain of truth in it. Like there was a lot of truth in, in surrounding what he said. Um, people just people just buy into that so there's some kind of balance uh, between having the confidence to say what you are obviously not to that crazy extent and and turning that into reality i'm not one of these believers in either uh, this secret and put it out to the universe and you become it or otherwise Believe me, as I sat on my couch with my head in my hands in around the 2012, I was putting everything out to the universe and it wasn't giving me a whole lot back. <laughs> but if, if, you can, yeah. if, you tell, if you can if you can stand up and tell people you're okay during those times, people buy into that. You, you, you are what you are exactly what you transmit. So I'm not one of these people of vibrations and the sun's rays are picking me up or otherwise. But I've had, the reason I give that example, for a period of time, we were running football clubs and we were, I was flying over this guy, Bentley driver, picking me up in London to bring me to this castle every week. He's sitting in a pool with his Russian girlfriend that he's telling me is the son of an oligarch. I bought into it. And not just me, the heads of many banks uh, bought into this. You become exactly what you project. And there's some there's there's something in that of the of these guys on YouTube standing up and fist bumping the air or whatever, they're on that wave. They they they, they probably if you, you talk enough ridiculousness, you kind of become that you know that image that you paint. Obviously, to maintain it, there has to be genuine substance behind it. So if I was to go back and talk to myself, I would say two things. One food and shelter, ring fence that off so that you have the mind space. And then after that, no matter how bad things get, carry on like nothing's happening. And eventually that turns. And with the passage of time, you get those extra pieces of the jigsaw that ultimately you'll, you'll, you'll dig yourself out of the hole. It's amazing. And it's something that you, you wrote up there with Connor. I think it was, he put up a tweet or an Instagram post, I don't know, a little while ago. Um, we're both big fans. Like, well, I was actually in Canada during his rise. So I had a a real connection with the Irish community. We got, we'd all get together, go watch the fights and all that type of stuff. Um, but he put out something recently, or I don't know if it was before the Corona stuff, but it was uh, like a, a picture of a tweet that he put out in 2012 or something. And it's like, just said under it, it's like visualization. It worked for me. <laughs> well, well, the only thing I would say is there's another 10,000 guys behind him who will probably put out that tweet in the UFC and it didn't work. I mean, if you're work, if I was, if I was working on the logarithm or whatever to work this out or some form of algorithm for a computer to work it out, everyone looks to the guy and oh, look, he said this would happen and it happened. Nobody looks to the other 9,999 that said, like I'm, I'm in uh, SPG gym. Um, you know, I train there religiously. I don't meet a guy on the mats who doesn't tell you he's the best, that he's going to the top. Um, yeah. to, to a lot, many of them are, but I, there's more people on those mats who told me they're going to the top who aren't going to go to the top. And when one hits it, afterwards, everyone, he said it all along. That culture, no disrespect, Connor, but that culture, mm -hmm. if you're going to get into a cage and fight somebody, if you don't believe, if you don't have this almost delusion about you're invincible, uh, then you're not invincible. So that culture of that kind of braggadocio, I remember kind of the first day he walked into my office. Um, people say to me sometimes, you know, is, is that an actor or, or otherwise that he puts on? I remember looking at him. I, I don't know. Um, there's another friend of mine. He fought for a world title, Patrick Island, and we'd gone over. I acted for him. We'd gone over. He was fighting on the Mayweather undercard. And we'd gone to Vegas. And this was in my heady days where I went to Vegas twice a year, and you know, all of the the vagrancies of Vegas. So I remember going over to him. I can remember trying to give, like, somewhat, you know, silly when I look back, trying to give Conor advice uh, at, at the start. But the one the one thing that I can say from the, from the day I met him was whether it was delusion or absolute confidence, he believed. Like, there was no act. That's not an act. 
from the day he sat across me, the only thing, and, and it was more forceful than most of the people that I encounter. Like, so I believe him when he says that he has that vision. I don't believe it was coincidence or otherwise. The only caveat I would add to all of that is when our gym opens up, I think it's the 8th of August, I'm counting down the days, I'll go back onto the mats with another 20 guys who are absolute killers who are all telling me they're going to the top. You probably won't have them on this podcast ever. We'll probably never hear of them and they'll probably never make it to the top. And they'll be sitting at home with their vision boards, <laughs> moving around, you know? Exactly. There is, there is obviously like uh, ingredients to that success, like uh, and visualization and self-belief is part of it. I would also say maybe the obsessive compulsive work ethic, like have you seen from, from looking at successful people in different areas, is there a number of ingredients mixed together that will produce that top level? I think the, the, the the overall ingredient, and this is kind of because everybody wants to believe if they work hard enough, they'll make it. The one ingredient, and you know, I don't come from this world, I don't come from a particularly connected world uh, uh, in that sense. I didn't go to Blackrock, I didn't go to Clongos, I don't have that, I, did, I didn't come out of that, uh, that, that kind of pathway. Uh, the one ingredient, and people don't want to hear this, um, it's, it's not the YouTube videos. It's not if you do your vision board. It's not, it's who you know. If your dad knows someone, you're a million miles ahead from the start. And, you know, you could, particularly in law, um, it's the most incestuous click uh, to break into that you, that you would possibly imagine. So if, you, if someone was to say to me, it's a real, it's not great for a business podcast because everyone wants to take, or, take away something and, and, and kind of, I'm going to work on that. I'm going to make it. If someone said to me, what's the main ingredient? You can be brilliant, but if you don't know anyone, I, I, when, you don't know anyone, you're going nowhere. I had a fantastic idea. To this day, actually, I saw someone try to steal it. When I was about 21, I thought, this is how I'm going to make my fortune. It was, I tried to develop a patent uh, for, uh, and I can hear my business partner laughing at me now as I, as I relay this, and you're probably going to laugh when I tell you this a spray machine for tanning but they're not tanning sorry to convert a tanning machine so you know you, women go to weddings or whatever they go in they undress they hold up these two things they go, and you're sprayed with tan in a second and you find it beautifully inside what i wanted to do was convert that technology to a booth that sits at the side of every beach every swimming pool at a hotel and you get in with the likes to say nivea you get in you put your two hands up you hit factor eight and it's so there's no more can you do my back oh did you miss a bit you're sitting out damn it i thought this is the best this is the best and then i had i worked out all these other things if i was going to sell advertising i was talking to the four seasons at the time at the, the hotel resort I was going to sell you know coke ads on the side and all these magnificent revenues done to this day as laughable as it sounds i think that is the one of the best ideas that i've ever had in my entire <laughs> life because it was it, it, it created revenues that you know you didn't have to do anything you just like every, there's beaches everywhere there's hotels everywhere everyone wants to put on sun cream contact you free eat. you don't have to touch anyone this is quick if you're selling advertising and it's a brilliant product yeah as I sit here today in my house, I can tell you it never got off the ground. And the reason it didn't get off the ground is not that I don't think it's a great idea, although I'm sure there's people listening to this rolling their eyes, not that I didn't think it was a great idea. It was, I wasn't connected. So if I had a, if I had a, if I had a owned a, a chain of, if I had owned the Four Seasons, you'd probably be interviewing me about my great spray tanning, our, our Nivea cream machine. The reason, it didn't, the reason it didn't get off the ground was, and I didn't know this at 21, because you buy into this nonsense of YouTube, just get your idea and stay up late and keep working and put in the hours. No, my dad didn't own a hotel chain, so I couldn't get it out there. If my dad was Bill Gates, you'd probably be talking to me now about this wonderful invention. So the first thing is, or your mother, I should say, obviously, uh, the first thing is your network. And it's that network that, as you permeate all of your ideas so if you have a great idea that's that's very nice and maybe you will be the, the guy who creates the vaccine for this flu pandemic and and that would take off regardless of your parentage or your network or your what school you went to it will take off but for most people i was selling legal advice for most people um it's going to require a network so if you were to say to me you know, what, what, what should an entrepreneur work on? Meet people. I don't care whether they're in your business or not in your business. Everyone knows somebody. Everyone is like, Kupi, you meet someone today and it's a year down the road, especially in law, actually. 
you get a call. I don't know whether you remember me. I met you having a, a coffee two years ago on such and such a breakfast. I have this problem. I don't know. So it's, a, it, it, it's that expansion of network. It's like if you could give out on every, on every idea you had one million flyers, someone's going to pick it up. It's that network. And that network applies to every business. So the idea, yeah, has to be good and working hard and all the rest. They're all givens. Actually, I'm not so sure about working hard. That's another bit of a myth as well, because anyone I've ever, anyone, anyone I've ever encountered who's super wealthy, they don't work hard. They may work incredibly smart, and there's a, there's a raft of people under them who are absolutely breaking their balls, but I wouldn't exactly define them as working particularly hard. But if the idea is good and the network is right, you're flying. This business of, again, on all these YouTube clips of, you know, stay up late, and you just put the work in, everyone works hard. Everyone, you know, anyone who's going anywhere does the 23 hours and 24 hours. They all don't make it. And that, like any client that I would have that is super wealthy, they probably call me after this, you know, to berate me. They don't work hard. They were very smart. They don't work hard. Sitting out in some yacht in Marbella or something, they don't work particularly hard. Great. Might be taking a call, you know, might be, might be meeting the right guy on the boat, but they don't work, work particularly the so many so many little pieces of the puzzle are put coming together in my mind as you're speaking about all the successful people that i know and i'm like wait a minute they're not working that hard they're uh they but they know it like i remember my um the the ceo of a company i worked for a startup in, in vancouver for a couple of years and the ceo was it uh eccentric the wrong word i don't know how you describe him. i got on really well with him he had, there was mixed opinions let's say of this guy but he would come into the office with like uh random billionaire Turkish guys to show them around that get investments. And then the next day it would be, uh, you know, the head of the biggest bank in Canada. And like, how does he know these people? Like, and that's, that's really what he just focused on. He didn't really, he never did any of the, the work in the, in the business at all. That's all he ever did. And I think that's what was, uh, was driving the business there. And it, it's interesting because we usually, this at the end of the, the podcast, we usually do um, uh, quick fire questions, right? And you covered two of our main ones there. One, we always say, is it who you know or what you know? And we've got some great answers from people, you know, different opinions, all that type of stuff. And we also, um, we ask, um, what's the best idea that you never, that you never... Uh, there you go. <laughs> so you nailed two. I, get, I gave them to them before the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just sort of... Work, right? but, um, it was very interesting because we talked to the, the guy who um, he runs all of the, the corporate stuff for the Dublin <laughs> Chamber. Um, so he does all the networking events and stuff. And he was really pushing that as well, the idea of the, the network, because it, it is something like when, on YouTube, when you look at the, the 10X type stuff, it is a lot of, uh, like, you know, if you read the, some of that guy's books, um, you can say <laughs> the schedule that he's suggesting is, you know, start calling people 6 a.m. through 12 a.m trying to sell them something rather than you know spending the time I think you you talked about it before luke it's the unfair advantage in irish they call it a buntashta. it's getting yeah. that unfair advantage to take it to the next step i know so many hard workers and so many ambitious people but you do need that unfair advantage i think and it's it's those connections but it's also the quality of your network you know if you look at sending out two thousand emails to people who signed up for something yeah, they're, they're, it's kind of like a network, but the quality of that connection is two of them might get back to you to, to buy your product or whatever. But if you actually have strong connections with people and have done business with them in the past, I, I'm always interested in like Like last year was our first year in business with my company, the recruitment company. And we did, we did well, um, largely down to who we knew. And it's mad to think about it like qualified, we're qualified accountants. Like we, we thought we were, we think we're good at what we do, but it was all about getting the clients in at the start and, and they're not going to come in. You can knock on doors to, to and people answer and they don't know who you are or you can knock on the door of someone who half knows you or get that warm introduction. I think the cold approach is very, very tough. So how yeah. how do you develop your network is, is, is the million dollar, literally the million dollar question. I, I, I think um, I'm the worst salesperson in the world, but I, I passionately detest when people call, call me. I, I I, I hate when, and unfortunately, I, whether I like it or not, however grandiose like, I, delusions I have in my head, I'm in the service industry. So I'm like a glorified waiter to an extent. I need to go up and, uh, you know, explain my wares to people and, and sell myself. I think, and again, it's an old kind of cliche, 
one belief, but you, you, there's a couple of thresholds you have to get into. So you, you, you have to have the ability. You have to know what you're talking about. Or you're going to be found out eventually in, in anything. Um, but to open that door, I think it's being comfortable, literally, you know, there's no magic formula, being comfortable in your own skin. And that sounds really easy. What was that? Just be yourself. I think when you when you can admit your failures, that's what I'm saying, I don't want to hear about all the success or otherwise. When you can admit your failures, it's quite disarming to people. It's like, oh, well, actually, I can identify with that far quicker if, if, there's, a, if there's a degree of sincerity. Oh, his, 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 this, this lunatic's, you know, biggest business moment is when he had his hands in his, or his face and his hands on his couch. But, but, but if you're genuine, if, and if you're in business, if you're, if you're, for want of a better description, a player for, for whatever period of time, that's going to happen. That's going to happen. And they're the moments that you need. It's like, they're the moments that you're alone. They're the moments that, like I said, walking into the bank, high-fiving everyone and you're, you know, that's easy. Anyone can do that. So in terms of expanding your network or otherwise, it is just literally being relaxed in who you are. And that is a massive journey. That sounds like a flippant off the cuff statement. That's probably a life journey. It's one certainly that I, I haven't mastered. But when you, when you know who you are, you can very quickly assess other people. Um, and when you're portraying a character for a period of time that you're not actually it, it's very difficult, I think, to, to move outwards with people. Of course, there are people who've made fantastic networks like the guy I've just described through effective fraud, the Madoffs of this world. But I think to have a sustained network, it's meeting people, uh, putting yourself in those circles. So there's, you know, I, I can remember laughing to myself. I joined one of those gentlemen's clubs on Stevens Green. And um, I was sitting there having my dinner with all these 90 year olds. It, it's putting yourself in, 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 uh, I don't want to say I view it as work because it sounds like you're using people or otherwise that's as important to meet that clique of people as sitting at home writing whatever or working on whatever great piece of technology or otherwise you're on because you're just going to be left in your bedroom with this great idea. Mm. Who who are those people do you think Graham? Do you think it's is there a young up and coming are they the next big thing that's going to happen the tech entrepreneurs or is it in Ireland, I think that's another ugly reality, particularly all I can talk about is I suppose, my own experience in terms of law. Yeah. There, are no, there are no real young hotshot lawyers. I have more grey hair now that people will actually listen to me. And if you're 20, you don't, if you're 20, you don't want to hear that. But say, if I can only speak about say, my profession, you know, it doesn't matter how brilliant you are at 23. That, that, that looked great in some Hollywood film. If you're a guy who's in jeopardy, you know, 200 million to a bank, are you really going to sit across from a guy who's 23? And listen, you need you need kind of a, a relationship with the person. And again, it's not a particularly sexy thing to say. It's like saying, well, you need a good network and, you know, a particular school might help you in that regard. And I didn't go to those schools. So, so you know, I can accept why people would rally against that or consider it elitist. In the same way, I, I, I would kind of consider you need years on the planet to develop the network because it's not some it depends what you define as a network you know you can be very famous at 22 but you have you, you have very little interactions with people and it's those interactions like anyone that i've encountered that's successful they're like i've been working with that guy for 20 years i know him from such and such yeah. the young, the younger you are just time on the planet and that's not you know for anyone listening who's 22 no, well, that's not particularly helpful that's the way it works, unfortunately. You have to be around. You have to be around. You have to be known. You have to make a particular noise. Of course, there will always be the one IT startup that at 18, uh, he rockets into the stratosphere. But for the majority of people, and the majority, certainly in professions, and for the majority of people who are in the sales industry or trying to, entrepreneurs who are trying to get things out, very few people make it on their first go and it's all those people you meet along the way and who are they well they're they're different in every depending on what you want to do if you're a cartoonist it's not going to be the same as if you're a surgeon creating some you know new method of surgery or otherwise um, it, it, all in your particular sphere you just have to be around and you have to keep going for a particular period of time whether that's work, whether you do that, whether you're up at five o'clock in the morning making those calls, you're having two coffees a day with people. I would go for the two coffees a day with people 
knowing them on a, in a genuine, linking with them in a, in, a, in a real type of sense than shooting out your 2,000 emails to, you know, whoever that falls into a spam box and you know, meeting the right people who can pull the strings for you along the way. The world isn't fair. And everyone wants to believe hard work and dedication, whatever. You know, the world isn't fair. Once you observe what it actually is, it's a series of links. It's a series of relationships that compel you up this kind of intangible stairway. You can, you can at least appreciate where the destination is. So I would say in whatever sphere you're in, genuine coffees with people over a prolonged period of time that's not particularly sexy advice there's no fireworks going off and not 10x anything but that's what i believe is, is genuine and real advice i think that's great advice as well and i think we like we could absolutely we got into a flow state there i looked down at the clock here we've been talking for an hour and a uh, hour and 20 here we usually finish off with a few uh, uh, quick fire questions i know we want to be respectful of time no like, problem. I know we covered a lot of uh, a lot of the questions here, anyway. But Mark, why don't you pick two or three that are really uh, yeah really interesting for you after having a chat? Yeah, great stuff. No, it's been absolutely absolutely super. Um, start off nice and easy. Just what what's your favorite social media and why? I have to say, Graham, before you answer, your Instagram is one of the best Instagrams I've ever seen. I was going to say Instagram because I, 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 you know, I was going to say Instagram. Not, and if you look at it, I'm terrible now. Complete narcissist. I follow absolutely nobody. I think I have 20 default people that I hit by mistake or something. I like, I like the photos. Um, I think I like Instagram simply because I, other stuff, like I don't have a Twitter or otherwise. Um, I think particularly in times of pandemic, when you're locked into your house, everyone has a comment and everyone is an expert. And I find social media just infuriating and that people are trying to make a name for themselves. Instagram, albeit that it's entirely false and all the rest, and you can be, you can be accused of all of those other vagancies. I think uh, the absence of words from people, I can look at their picture and it's a far more silent medium and that yeah. suits me just fine. Yeah, less noise, yeah. Um, okay, this is an interesting one. What time do you get up at in the morning and what time do you go to sleep? Well, that, that's actually, that's strange. You must be following me because um, all of my life I've been a disastrous sleeper. Um, and I've made a real effort since this pandemic. Uh, I never, like, I, I didn't get into bed until one o'clock. I didn't fall asleep until three. And I get out of bed in the morning, I'm four to five hours sleep. And all these people, like, telling you how wonderful your mind, you know, you don't need that amount of sleep. And I, I, I train every day, a disaster, a terrible lifestyle choice. And since the start of this uh, pandemic, I've been doing my best to get into bed at 10 o'clock, which to me is like sending a two-year-old or a three-year-old to bed at like six o'clock and the scream i hate I, ha I hated it for the first period for me you need all your sleep everything is about your mental state and regardless of your your physical recovery or otherwise get into bed early and get up early so that's what i have been doing i never did that ever in my life until this pandemic i was a complete night owl having lived with both experiences for me get into bed ensure certainly if you're doing any level of physical training Apart from that, even if you're in any kind of stressful environment, you need your eight hours. All this nonsense, you know. I, 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 and I have clients who tell me, one guy in particular, you know, I get four hours and I'm, you know, like it's like something to be proud of. It's nonsense. Get in, have your eight hours. I can relate to that. Um, how much money is enough money? I think it's the wrong question. It's, uh, how do you make yourself happy and content? And if that's a hundred million, it's a hundred million. If it's one million, it's one million. If it's 10 euros, it's 10 euros. The happiest people, there's no correlation, like I said, of a broad ranging client base from some of the wealthiest people in Ireland to you know, the average, uh, average income. And there is no correlation uh, if you were to do a, a graph of happiness and monetary amounts. Um, the people who have more money are generally, generally in my experience, the, 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 the super high achiever is more driven. And I, like I said at the start, I'd investigate why they're driven. So it all depends. So it's the wrong question. How, it's like saying, which is better, red or black? It's like There has to be context. There has to be context to the, the question. The money is an irrelevance. 
how do you develop contentment in your mind? How are you happy in and of yourself? That's the question. And it, 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 if part of that is, well, I need a financial base so that I have a place to live and, you know what, I'd like a holiday home in Spain as well. Okay, we can start to work out the financials after that. But it's the wrong question to ask. There's no context. Yeah. It's, such a, it's one of those questions that everyone has a, a different kind of... Based on it, yeah. I spoke to somebody during the week. I know we're digressing again. This happens a lot on the on the podcast there. But I was talking to somebody during the week who lost their job um, due to you know the current situation. And they, were, and they were worried about the the uh, the financial stuff. You know, about being a lot worse off than they had been. Like I said, a lot of debts and stuff like that. So a lot of stress there. Um, and it got me thinking. I, was, I, was, I said to them, um, "Well, back when I was broke, like they said, like before um, he started making you know commissions and stuff like that. But back when I was broke, I spent a lot of time." Um, kind of like in Thailand, living in huts on the beach and stuff, and it really wasn't that bad. Do you know what I mean? So, because, because, it's, because it's relativity. I mean, we're such yeah. competitive animals. When you're on the beach in Thailand, everyone else is on the beach in Thailand. You know, yeah. I, I've been out to Thailand to, tr- to train and things. All, all, all I do, you know, I'm, like I'm signing up to fight these Thai fighters over there, and all I wanted to do was, you know, win these fights because, I, you know, I'm running with Thai fighters who are, that, that's all they're thinking. So I'm like, signing up to these crazy fights and jungles in Phuket because that's what they're doing you come back then and uh, you know I'm, I'm running a, a different a different race here so everything is relativity unfortunately if you're in Ireland it's about did you get a mortgage you know like it, like see, these are the things that suck you down a financial path so it's all relative it's like you know when, I, when I'm packing shelves and duns like a lot of those guys are still my friends. It was some of the greatest times of my life. I didn't have an arse in my trousers. So there's no correlation because they didn't have an arse in their trousers because yeah. we're all in, in, in the same boat. It's how you feel relative to other people. And you can't tell yourself, no, I'm completely different and that doesn't affect me. You're sucked into it subliminally and subconsciously. You're there. So if you're in Thailand or, or, or otherwise, subconsciously there's a, there's a, 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 a relativity going on and that, that's why your contentment is far greater over there. It's like people saying there's people starving in Africa. I don't live in Africa. There's yeah. no starving on my road. So yeah. I'm, I'm the failure in my life. If I go to Africa and everyone's starving and I have 100 euros, I'm probably a king. But that, I, I don't live in Africa. So yeah. it's that re- relativity uh, uh, that kind of sets your mindset. Yeah. Luke, you visited the Maasai tribe in, in Africa and they were so happy, you said. Uh, I, I, went to, I went to Africa last year me and my wife we always wanted to go something that you know it's actually it's an expensive thing to to do but when you're there obviously there's a big di- disparity between you and them when it comes to you know like you said uh, relatively speaking but uh, we went to see the Maasai tribe um we we're actually we we're on a i don't going off thing here but we d- made like a donation to build them like a an internal uh like a oven uh, for their house so the smoke didn't fill our house and all that so we went to see them build that um but everyone in the tribe seemed incredibly happy they were living in huts they were they had their their heart or they had their uh their cows and stuff like that all the kids running around like there was it was a weird it really was a, a weird scene and it wasn't being put on they didn't really care that we were there like it was a I, I, I've, I've experienced i've experienced a similar type of thing I went to iceland on a training camp and there's not there's you know obviously not a whole lot to do in Iceland when it's particularly cold. It's wonderful. But where we are, we're staying in gym. And I think what you're describing is there's a community feel and everybody has their role to play. So everyone has their own importance within that community. So if there's an African tribe or otherwise, there's a less competitive, like everyone is as important as the the next guy because they're working as one unit when you come back to the likes of dublin there's no community unit it's just a race and that's how that's how people view it so like i said when i was in iceland you're sitting there and you're sleeping on a gym floor the only thing you're thinking of is you know can i have a lot of that guy's sleeping bag is he going to cook or is he going to be my training partner tomorrow everyone has a role you're one unit there's no competitive albeit ironically that it's the height of competitiveness. You're going to fight somebody the following day. But there's, as part of that structure, everyone has a relative role to play. So you're as important as the next guy. That's not what we feel when you come back from your holidays or otherwise and you, you, you fit back into this. It's very quick to go, you know, what, where am I going in life? What's, I'm, I'm losing my way because, that, because you've lost your kind of empowerment. Your role has, has evaporated. And you have to kind of define your own role, which is a it's kind of a weird thing in human society, I think, where we have to say, okay, you get the, the freedom to define your role, whatever you want to do, but um, also the stress that comes along with that. Mark, what about one more? One more, okay. Um, 
Is there one book or, or maybe one statement somebody's made to you that's had a big impact on you? One book? Um, I don't, you know, I, I, I think, I think the kind of that expression and, and this, and this too shall pass every crisis. Actually, I did, I did, uh, an advertising campaign that uh, concluded on the front of the Sunday Business Post not so long ago. And as an in-joke to myself, I put a slogan down the bottom. Um, I don't know whether you're familiar with who Hicks and Gracie is, but he was the, yeah. one of the founders, amongst the family of founders of Jiu-Jitsu. And uh, one of the things that he'd sold Jiu-Jitsu on was, and I put this on the front page of the Sunday Business Post, kind of as an in-joke to myself, uh, because I didn't think anyone else would get it. Um, was learning to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations. Now, what he was referring to obviously is, is when there's a man on top of you punching the head off of you, that you can maintain this inner calmness and think your way out of that problem. But that applies to everything. So if you can be, un if you can be comfortable in the continual uncomfortable situations, if you can function the same uh, in both environments, that's an incredible trait because that's what will happen. This too shall pass, whether that's success or failure, the ground will move from under you. That's the only certainty. And learning to be uh, comfortable in both of those environments, to be comfortable in uncomfortable situations, to credit to the Hicks and Gracie, who probably used it in a different context. Um, that's that's the one expression that I would say. And I think it's a great bombshell to leave, uh, leave the podcast on. Graeme, Kenny, thanks very much for joining us today. Uh, incredibly insightful. I think we both got a lot out of it. I know that our listeners will uh, get a lot out of this as well. They're going to learn, you know, all about what we were talking about as well as some of the other things around, you know, uh, around success, defining success for yourself rather than uh, letting other people do that. Also, don't buy the BMW when you're 22 when you can just yeah. make the, uh, the the payments over the next few months. <laughs> okay, thanks very much, Graham. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, Graham. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks, Appreciate it. Bye bye. Bye bye. Uh,